Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, your ticket to all things college football. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? Join us as we talk college football from the national championship to college rivalries to bowl games to the Heisman Trophy to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC College Football Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. My name is Ryan Lee. I hope you are continuing to stay safe amongst the pandemic. And we have got a whole load of things to you, including some new film has come out from a couple of pro days, including you know some of the top prospects around the world, especially in the skill positions. And we are even going to be getting into a potential debate as well as some updates from my last episode on the comparisons between the college football playoff and March Madness. Let's get right into it. And the whole thing going on with the NFL draft is that there is a whole lot that goes into it, obviously. What it essentially comes down to is that a lot of these top players around the entire world in their respective positions, they do a whole lot of things. Whether if it is just simply to increase the talent of a roster, whether if it is to increase the media hype and the buzz surrounding them, or whether if it is to progress in a player's career, whatever it may be. The draft is actually hyper important in terms of what it can do, not just for a player, but for an entire franchise. Let me examine those two sides of that coin. So the first one is that it really helps the player. You know, a lot of people have gone through it, especially now where getting a job, any sort of job, is super important in life. But it's even more important now when unemployment is so high. And when you can get a job, not just anywhere, but especially in your specialized field, it can be a really awesome thing to do. But also, it's a really good way to progress in life, essentially. And the reason why I mention all this is because for a lot of these college players, they're focusing on progressing into the next stage of their career, their football career. Now, you could be like most of these players who want to make it as far as they can go to see what they are capable of, to see what they can do at that NFL level, at that professional level. Some of the guys in this draft, they're going to fall. They are not going to really pan out. They are most likely going to bounce around between practice squads. Some of them are going to maybe not even make it into the league. They're probably going to get cut right out of the gate. And at that point, they'll need to figure out what to do from there. In some other cases, what you have is some guys who are there to fill a role of some kind. Whether if it is as depth or in some cases to just learn and grow and develop because in some of those players' instances, they have certain flaws, they have certain weaknesses that can't necessarily be overlooked at the moment, stuff that is maybe too big or too concerning for a team to put on the active roster. In some of those cases, those might be injury, those might be play, it could be consistency, it could be work ethic, it could be anything really. I remember there was the whole ordeal back around 2015 or 16 with the whole Laramie Tunsil gas mask bong debacle. There was some concern with certain other players, whether if it was 
you know, character issues. Like Baker Mayfield, he had the police video and the headshot where those type of things just kind of concern them. However, in some of those instances, what happens is that it gets developed into them. They learn how to get past it. They learn how to overcome that. You know, Laramie Tunsil now is one of the highest paid linemen in the entire NFL. Baker Mayfield is essentially the Lord and Savior of the Cleveland Browns franchise. And he is essentially the only thing that is going to keep the Browns afloat, essentially. He's going to be determinant on whether the Browns succeed for years to come or whether they'll fail and go back to where they just were. And in some cases, for the player, this is their time to have an impact and leave a legacy. In some cases, that legacy can be instantaneous. The effect that the player has on their team, on their family, on their careers is very monumental in terms of what it does for them in the moment. It provides them with lots of money, some cases more than they've ever had in their entire life combined. It provides them and their family with opportunities. Opportunities to continue playing and working hard in one of the most coveted positions in all sports. And not just that, but it gives them a chance to go off into several other sectors of their industry as well. In a lot of those cases, that legacy or that impact that the players have, they're very localized. They just fall within the community of the team they're in. This isn't a draft example. However, it is just an example where Drew Brees and his leadership and his consistently work hard grinder mentality is one of the many reasons why New Orleans essentially got revived after Hurricane Katrina. Another non-draft related instance was when J.J. Watt stepped up and essentially revived Houston after Hurricane Harvey. In another instance, you essentially had a consistently failing franchise and one who was actually on the brink of relocation. This is not a football example, but the example stands in the NHL and the Pittsburgh Penguins. If you know anything about the NHL, you would know the story of how the Penguins were actually not even supposed to be in Pittsburgh after 2003. How they created this plan in the early 2000s, late 90s to relocate the Penguins. And then what happened is that after the lockout of 2006, Sidney Crosby not only got drafted, but the hype that he brought up the impact he left almost immediately transformed the entire city of Pittsburgh for that Penguins franchise and his impact actually kept the Penguins in Pittsburgh if you know anything about hockey you know the story about how Sidney Crosby is the one reason the only reason why the Penguins are still in Pittsburgh if it did not happen, if Crosby did not get drafted that year, if Crosby did not win three Stanley Cups for the Penguins since he's come in, four finals appearances, three Cups for one player, and then the dominoes started falling after that. The Geno Malkins start coming in. Marc-Andre Fleury starts playing at elite levels. The Jake Gensels come in. Then you get guys like Latang and Rust. Phil Kessel gets traded. And then the Pittsburgh Penguins become a powerhouse for the rest of their time in the last decade and a half. In those other two examples, the Saints win the Super Bowl after Brees comes in. And then 
they become perennial playoff contenders and Super Bowl contenders the entire way through. Without the drafting of Russell Wilson, who knows where Seattle is right now? Who knows where the Seahawks are? Because, yes, you get the Legion of Boom, but at the same time, what good is a good defense if you can't retaliate with a good offense? Just ask the Atlanta Falcons in the 70s. Ask the Bears in the 80s. In a lot of those cases, those impacts that are left by a certain player, they change an entire franchise for the rest of history. The Indianapolis Colts, somewhere in the ballpark at the last 15 to 20 years before they get paid Manning, were essentially perennial losers. Where they didn't really make any big splashes. They didn't really go on that many super deep playoff runs. They didn't really do anything super meaningful. And then they get Peyton Manning. AFC championships come along. MVPs roll around. They win a Super Bowl. You want to talk about a recent example? We can talk about the Buffalo Bills as well. The longest playoff drought in history. And then Josh Allen comes along. He learns. He grows. He develops. And then he takes that team and helps turn them into essentially perennial playoff contenders. Just this past year, they were Super Bowl contenders. The Cleveland Browns, the same thing. They don't just draft Baker, but they build the pieces around him. The offensive line, the defense, the wide receiving core, the tight ends, whomever it may be. And the next thing you know, Baker develops and he grows and he learns into who could potentially be a dangerous force in the AFC for years to come. We're seeing that with Kyler Murray and the Houston Texans right now. Is it a little more of a all-star team from 2014? Sure. But you get some of those guys, you know, the J.J. Watts with Chandler Jones on the other end. You have Buda Baker in the secondary. You get guys like DeAndre Hopkins. You get guys like A.J. Green on the other side. Kyler Murray could potentially take that team use that number one overall pick just a few years ago and turn them into something special. This drafting process is so nitpicky and so careful because of the potential that a single pick can have. And it doesn't necessarily have to be quarterbacks. It can be other positions too. And the Legion of Boom isn't the Legion of Boom if Seattle doesn't take a fifth round pick on Richard Sherman. They're not the Legion of Boom if they take another, you know, late round pick on a guy like Earl Thomas. Or when they drafted guys like Bobby Wagner or KJ Wright. Or you can't have the Kansas City Chiefs the way they are now without taking a risk and moving up to get Patrick Mahomes. Or without drafting a guy on the outside for a fifth round draft pick in Tyreek Hill. Build on that foundation with Travis Kelsey. Get some defensive guy. Draft a Brashad Breland. Sign a Tyron Matthew. Trade for Frank Clark. Whomever it may be. That whole process is so much extra important, especially it is now. Especially with the amount of parity as we've been seeing with the league now. The amount of parity, the amount of change, the not really one team dominates all that the NFL provides for you. You know, we get some of the most shocking upsets, not just in the NCAA basketball tournament, but we also see them a lot in the NFL. No one expected the Las Vegas Raiders to beat the Kansas City Chiefs in Arrowhead. No one expected Jalen Hurts and the Eagles to essentially give the Saints that one loss that helped them push out of first place in the playoffs. Or another instance you could say is Cincinnati beating Pittsburgh on Monday Night Football. Or the Washington football team handing the Steelers that first loss on Tuesday night football, essentially, 
which essentially knocks over the next domino effect into what's to come in Pittsburgh. And the reason why I'm mentioning all this is because the ways players are not just perceived into the drafting process, but the way they're actually drafted actually matter a lot. And there's been this whole debate between a lot of broadcasters. However, I refer to this one individual in particular a couple of weeks ago who is Chris Sims of NBC Sports. The reason why I mentioned him specifically is because 90% of the draft boards that I have seen have Trevor Lawrence first and Zach Wilson second. He was, I believe, the only draft board I saw where Zach Wilson was first and Trevor Lawrence was second. And it kind of got me thinking about why they think so. And Sims actually went on a recent interview with Good Morning Football on the NFL Network and actually explained the reasoning of his decision, explained why he chose and decided the way he did. And the reason why I mentioned all of those previous points is because he actually mentioned some of them in this interview with Good Morning Football. He talks about how Wilson is able to throw at a more consistent you know, basis. The way his arm angles are, his release, his technique, it's almost the same every single time. And when you match, you know, not just a more powerful arm, but a more, I guess, talented, for less than a better word, where you can throw at any angle, thrown off balance, throwing off of anything, and hitting the receivers on a dot, mixed with his athleticism, really puts the edge in Zach Wilson's favor. And that ability to improvise and scramble and using the legs to build enough time to throw the ball on the around the field is super important in today's game. Let's think of the top three MVP candidates of this last year. They were Aaron Rodgers, Josh Allen, and Patrick Mahomes. Now, what do all those three guys have in common that is highly touted amongst almost every single scout reporter, broadcaster, coach, etc. in the NFL game right now. There's two things that almost all of the mentions. They have a super strong arm. Mahomes, check. Allen, check. Rodgers, check. And they can all use their legs and scramble and build that time. Rodgers has been doing it for years. If you've seen any of his Hail Marys, that's all he does. If you've seen most of his deep ball, that's all he does. Mahomes, you saw the Super Bowl. He ran around the most amount of yards in a single Super Bowl, all while scrambling. And Josh Allen, just watched a clip where he hurdles Anthony Barr versus the Vikings his rookie year. Not this past season, 2020, but the year before, 2019, his second year, he led the league in rushing touchdowns amongst quarterbacks. I'm just going to leave it at that. With the way that the game is trending now, the trends suit Zach Wilson more. However, the overall fit, the overall scheme, and the overall ability falls on the side of Trevor Lawrence. You know, he was born and raised in Georgia, goes to Clemson, which is South Carolina, just one state up. And assuming he gets drafted where he should be drafted, which is in Jacksonville, he's only one state down from his hometown. You know, they all just kind of connect to each other in that way. However, there is a common debate when it comes to players from big name schools versus on smaller name schools. Or whether if they're from top tier programs or maybe bottom tier programs and that is that does the school size matter does having a top tier team actually matter when it comes to that ability 
to run an offense. That ability to throw at the right receivers. Because one of the big things that was mentioned is not only will he be a fit in the Urban Meyer system, which is a little more college that Cliff Kingsbury system, that what's going to be the Urban Meyer system, those college schemes, will they be a better fit? Will they make that transition to the NFL easier? Especially for someone who has that talent, who's been considered that generational performer. But most importantly, does it fit that market in terms of the rest of it going around it? The jerseys, the tickets, the merch, the number of eyes on the screen. Do all those things also line up with everything going on? Because if I were a team, I think... Trevor Lawrence, a guy who's seen his generational talent, most certainly drives more buzz than Zach Wilson. And nothing against Zach Wilson. I think he's really good. However, the buzz, the amount of attention, the hype that Trevor Lawrence can create is much greater than that of Zach Wilson. And then there's the other debate on small school versus big school. We're talking BYU a relatively small school, if I'm not mistaken. They were independent this year. They had no conference affiliation. And then Clemson, the ACC, one of the top programs in the league, top four almost every single year ever since the CFP system came into effect. It's essentially, does big school versus small school matter? And part of that reasoning is that the weaker team could affect the level of discomfort And the ability to throw in a smaller window. He's more used to that already. He's already comfortable with that. And because he's comfortable with those type of things. Does it force people. I guess for lack of a better term. Or do people in general just focus on the wrong things in that circumstance. Whether if it's like the school they went to. Or the win-loss record. Because... Patrick Mahomes, arguably the best quarterback in the league right now, he went 4-7 and seven his draft year. He went to Texas Tech. Some of those top quarterbacks didn't go to the biggest schools in the world. Those Texas Techs, Wyoming. You know, you really think about some of the top quarterbacks, not just in the league, but you really think about them. You think about some of the schools they went to. I just mentioned Josh Allen to Wyoming. Big Ben Roethlisberger went to Miami of Ohio. Lamar Jackson, Teddy Bridgewater, both went to Louisville. Then you got Ryan Tannehill, who went to Texas A&M. Carson Wentz just got traded to the Colts. He goes to North Dakota State. Derek Carr went to Fresno State. Dak Prescott just signed a massive contract. Went to Mississippi State. Daniel Jones went to Duke. Aaron Rodgers went to Cal, which is not really that much of a football powerhouse. Matt Ryan, actually one of the most underappreciated quarterbacks, went to Boston College. And Russell Wilson went to Wisconsin, which isn't really known for being a very offensive-heavy school. And when you put that whole small school, big school debate into effect... It really helps you consider and helps you think about what type of things those small school guys go through. All the learning, all the progression, all the training they have to go through, whatever it may be. I'm actually going to go over the Zach Wilson Pro Day footage next week because I kind of wanted to bring up this whole debate between the small school and the big school quarterbacks and why the careers kind of line up. Now, this is no discredit on big school quarterbacks at all, actually. Because let me run through some of the big schools where some of these other quarterbacks actually go to. Alabama, 
USC, Oklahoma, actually three times through Oklahoma with Baker, Kyler, and Hertz, LSU, Clemson, twice, I suppose, Oregon, you know, Michigan State, Florida State, University of Michigan, Georgia. Some of those bigger schools have produced a lot of good quarterbacks too. Who knows where this is going to go? Who knows how this is going to go? We're obviously going to wait and see. However, it begs that question. Will Trevor Lawrence succeed more because he had better coaching, better weapons, better opportunities? Or is Zach Wilson going to succeed more because the school that he went to, maybe not the biggest, the team around him that he played with, maybe not the greatest, and the windows that he might have had to throw to were not the tightest? We'll just have to wait and see as per usual. That's all I got in terms of more of the quarterback debate as well as the whole scouting program. And coming up right after the break, we have got some pro day footage to break down as well as some small updates on the whole debate between the college football playoff and March Madness. That's all coming up right after this. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. There's actually been a lot of Pro Day footage that has come out within the last week or so. Especially when I have been trying to analyze it, kind of putting things into perspective, especially with everything going on with the NCAA basketball tournament with March Madness. I'll get more into that a little bit. But I've been looking over some of the top prospects. And there are four prospects who really stuck out to me. Not only because, you know, their footage came out and I watched it and they were the only ones available, but also I just thought that what they provided was actually some upside. And I could go into quarterbacks all day, all night. You know, I could talk about Mac Jones forever. I could talk about Zach Wilson forever, but I'm actually going to save those for next week. So if you want to hear my deep dive into Zach Wilson's and Mac Jones's pro day footage, uh, stay tuned for next week. However, I focused on really four prospects because not only did the footage actually come out, but I thought some of the measurables and the storylines amongst these four specific prospects were actually very interesting to say the least. I'm going to go down the list. I have these in no particular order whatsoever. Not by position, not by school, not by name, nothing. I just have them bunched up by position. And I'm going to actually start off on the one receiver on my list, who in this case was Elijah Moore 
from Ole Miss. Now, he is a very interesting case to me. He not only was a Bolitnikov finalist, but he was also a first-team All-American and All-SEC candidate, which means he definitely has a lot of upside in terms of where he stacks up versus some of the other receivers in the game right now. Not only considered one of the top receivers in one of the toughest conferences, but also one of the top receivers in the entire nation as a first-team All-American. However, I think it confused me the most is, I guess the way that they name the All-Americans, because if you're an All-American, you should be the top player on the draft board almost consistently throughout almost every single bit of the drafting process. However, on most draft boards that I saw, Elijah Moore was listed as number 5 or number 6, which means he definitely has the ability to go in the top 5 of all receivers. And especially with some of the guys who are coming into this draft, you know, you get the Devontae Smiths, you get the Jalen Waddles, you get the Jamar Chases, you know, that's tough competition to stack up against. And especially when you compare those guys, you know, they get their quarterbacks like Mac Jones versus Ole Miss, who didn't really have anyone that notable at quarterback. Now, from what I saw of Moore's pro days, and this is going to go the same across the four prospects I'm going to name today, but I focus mostly on their combine drills that they did and really focused on comparing them to other NFL players. Now, why did I do this? It's literally so I can get a good idea of where a certain player can be in terms of combining their full combine performance into a single player, kind of putting a perspective on things. Now, Elijah Moore... If I'm not mistaken, he's on the shorter side for receivers. Only 5'8", if I'm not believe, if I'm not mistaken. But he actually had some very good uh, combine numbers, actually. He has a really strong bench. It's actually very similar to that, to guys like Todd Gurley, to guys like Marcus Peters. Speaking of Marcus Peters, he actually has the exact same broad jump score as Marcus Peters as well, as he hit a 10-1, but it's also the same as Bill Safety. Micah Hyde, as well as he's actually really quick, which is something I never really considered. He actually matches up very well to one of the best deep ball receivers in the game, actually, in Will Fuller, and actually a Pro Bowl corner as well in Denzel Ward. Now, in terms of some of these other drills, kind of focusing on the explosiveness, that shiftability, the 6'6 on the three cone I wasn't sure if that was really quick at first, but then I saw some of the other scores on the three cone and found it's actually a pretty quick score. Uh, He actually got the same result as guys like Denzel Mims of the Jets or Isaiah McKenzie of the Bills, you know, all those slot guys, those guys who are very shifty, who have to really focus on the elusiveness aspect of their game. And then you have to have a guy who... Despite being five foot eight, he's got to be able to make the grab, especially if it's low of his reach. That's actually why the 36 inch vertical, at least to me at least, was such a big deal compared to guys like Jonathan Taylor and Montez Sweat. Because when you're a receiver and you know that quarterback throws that ball a little higher than you expect, you got to be able to get up there, especially against some of these other corners who might not have that same vertical, that one to two inch extra on the vertical versus a guy who's maybe a tad bit taller than you. Having that extra inch to a vertical is actually such a big deal, especially in today's NFL when almost all players across the board are getting bigger, they're getting faster, they're getting stronger, they're jumping higher, so on and so forth. And speaking of guys who really have you know, those bigger, faster, stronger 
assets, especially when it comes to someone in, let's say, the wide receiver position, is someone on the opposite side of the ball. I'll start off with a corner, Asante Samuel Jr. Not only has he got some NFL lineage in him, he was actually a part of the first team All-ACC with Florida State. He is, for the most part, number three and number four on most draft boards. Now, in terms of speed and in terms of explosiveness, he really does have quite a bit of it. Even though his power might not really compare, hitting a 12 on the bench isn't the most impressive thing in the world. However, when you consider that's the same score as some guys like Nelson Aguilar, but more importantly, Mike Evans, the receiver for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, is actually kind of you know, a much bigger deal. Especially when you consider how Samuels, he plays a much more shiftier, quicker style of play rather than a guy like Evans, who's a little more physical, who uses more of his frame. Especially when you need a guy who is really fast on the ball. He ran a 695 three-cone drill. That's the same as guys like... Michael Gallup, that same shifty, quick guy, and Deshaun Watson, kind of on that same boat. And he is actually really quick off the ball, too. 445 on the 40, which compares to guys like Jerry Judy and Buda Baker. And yes, my first thought when I saw Buda Baker was that clip of DK Metcalf chasing down Buda Baker on what was supposed to be a pick six before Metcalf chased him down. However, if I'm not mistaken, Metcalf did run a 40, I think in the four threes. Low four threes, and Baker ran in the mid four fours. So that one tenth of a second difference was actually huge. Now, for a guy like Samuel, I believe he's on the taller side, right around the Six foot range, I want to say. Five ten, close enough. He's not the highest one to get off the ball, that's for sure. And the explosiveness in his legs might not be ideal. Because he only got a 35 inch vertical. But when you compare the rest of his game, the vertical isn't the end all be all. You know, Michael Thomas and Jair Alexander. Got that same score at 35 inches. And hitting a 10-4 on the broad was actually comparable to guys like CeeDee Lamb and Jadeveon Clowney. Two guys who were very highly touted the year that they came out of the draft. With Samuel, his big make or breaker is going to be out of necessity. I know there's a lot more dynamic, a lot more explosive guys on the defensive end of the ball. However, with the way that the game is going right now, where you might not just have one number one receiver, but you could have a number one receiver who can play the one, he can play the two, he can play the slot, he can play anywhere. You're going to need a guy like Asante Samuel Jr. to really get after those guys. But one guy who most certainly can most likely get to anyone the way they are or no matter where they are, it's really going to be Patrick Sertan, the second. He's really big for his size. He's sitting at 6'2". So that's why some of the numbers that he put up are just absolutely outstanding. He is number one or number two on both draft fours amongst cornerbacks as well as being the SEC's Defensive Player of the Year. Now, the fact that he's 6'2", puts a lot of these other stats into perspective because he's most likely going to have to guard a lot of those bigger receivers. You know, the DeAndre Hopkins of the world, the DK Metcalfs, a lot of those guys who are super tall and can really use their size. They're Mike Evans, the Julio Joneses, those guys who are ridiculously tall especially when you consider that he scored a 10 foot 11 on the broad jump 
and a 39 inch on the vertical. You know, that 10-11 compares to guys like Alvin Kamara and Henry Ruggs, two of the better skill players in the league right now, especially with Ruggs. You know, he's seen as a burner. He could go up for those 50-50 balls with Derek Carr. Patrick Sertan could be a good guy to block him up against. And then when you go for the 39-inch vertical, going for those jump balls, Denzel Ward, once again, he was a pro bowler. Debo Samuel really exploded as a receiver the last several years. But also, the thing that Sertan also has, he's got a lot of strength. He's got a lot of power in his joints. He can really explode. He can really push, especially when his 18 rep bench score compares to guys like one of the best box safeties, one of the best blitzing safeties in the league in Jamal Adams, and arguably, almost without a doubt, the best blocking tight end in George Kittle. If you've ever seen George Kittle's blocking footage, it's insane. He pancakes guys. He's a tight end. He's supposed to be catching passes and hitting the end zone, but no, he can also block very well as well. And when you can have that type of explosive list, that type of push-off, that type of upper body strength against some of these bigger linemen, it's really important to have. And don't forget the fact that he's just as quick as Asante Samuel Jr. And just as fast as some of those receivers, especially some of the best number ones and some of the best defensive players too. His 40 is a 4-4-6. But that actually matched up to two of the best players in the game right now. The safety, Minka Fitzpatrick, and the wide receiver, Stefan Diggs. That is what his 40 compares to. Two all pros, one on both sides of the ball. He can move like that. He can keep up with a lot of some of the top guys in the league. Especially at a guy at corner where he's going to have to keep up with those top receivers. His job is going to be so much easier. And the last prospect I really focused on was Micah Parsons. But with him, I didn't focus so much on the speed aspect because he's a linebacker. I focused a little more on the power aspect of it and being able to cover other guys. Especially considering the fact that Parsons opted out of the 2020 season. He is still highly regarded as the top linebacker on most draft boards. Which, if you ask me was a little puzzling at first. But that same thing kind of happened with Trey Lance, where he didn't really play the entire year, but was still so highly regarded on most draft boards. Micah Parsons might be a linebacker, but he is a bit of an athletic freak. He got a 19-rep bench. Not only does that compare to guys like Carlos Hyde, but it compares to Arguably one of the best defensive linemen in the game at Frank Clark. And when you compare that with speed and agility, with not only some of the top skill guys, but some of the top rushers in the game, it's scary what Micah Parsons can do. That 4-3-9 that he ran compares to guys like Isaiah Simmons, who got drafted by the Cardinals last year, but also one of the top up-and-coming running backs in the game in Jonathan Taylor. His 683 three-cone not only compares to one of the best slot receivers in the game in Tyler Lockett, but arguably, without a doubt, one of the best rushers in the game in Joey Bosa. And not just that, but he can explode. He has abilities and the skill to potentially cover people. He goes at 10-6 in the broad. He's got explosiveness. He's got power. Guys like Michael Thomas and Chris Godwin, who he's most likely going to have to cover. Guys who he can really drive the legs against if he has to cut any blocks. And if he's ever in coverage with a tight end, let's say a slot receiver, he's got two of the best safeties in the game to compare against. Harrison Smith and Tyron Matthew. A lot of what these skill guys bring is a whole lot of athleticism, shiftiness, speed. 
And I understand that the combine is kind of an entire culmination of what can you do athletically. I understand that's what the combine is. However, when you really combine all those things together, those attributes, and where those athletes line up as well as where they compare to some of these other guys and the accolades they've already received so early on in their career, it shows that these guys have a lot of potential in what's to come. The possibilities for them are so high. It's just a matter of what can we actually see from them in their new respective teams. There's going to be a lot of guys who kind of go where they expect to. A lot of those guys who might fulfill their roles, who might take time to learn, take time to develop. A lot of those guys who will make that heavy impact right out of the gate. We don't know who's what. It's unpredictable. The next thing you know, you see a team, a number 15 seed, Oral Roberts, going to the Sweet 16. Or also, you could get a team like Gonzaga do exactly what they are expected to do. But we don't really know because we haven't seen anything play out yet. We still have to see how things go, where things fall, where the chips go. I can't wait to see how this goes. Because just like the NCAA basketball tournament, you never know what you're going to get. You never know when you're going to get a miraculous buzzer beater. You never know when you're going to get a random person who you've never seen before or a team you've never seen before make a deep run. Oral Chicago got to the Sweet 16. Oral Roberts got in the Sweet 16. Oregon State is a 12 seed. They got to the Elite 8. We don't know what's to come. We don't know what's available. But I can't wait to find out. That's been it for us here at the GSMC College Football Podcast. Make sure to like us, give us a five star, and write a review. It really helps us out. Don't forget to share and post us every single where you go. Don't forget to find us on all your favorite social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, so on and so forth. Make sure to share us everywhere you go. And don't forget to tune in next week where I'm going to be bringing up a lot more on the quarterbacks on Pro Day. And don't forget to subscribe to this show and find out what happens in my review of the Pro Day footage of some of the top quarterbacks in this year's draft. For all of us here at the GSMC Podcast Network. This has been the GSMC College Football Podcast. I've been your host, Ryan Lee. I hope you have a great rest of your night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From football to basketball, baseball to MMA, and even soccer. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast.